you know, we are the uh, fifth largest economy in the world and by 27 end, we should hopefully be the third largest economy in the world. Uh, we've also carried out very vast uh, structural reforms in the Indian economy. And uh, uh, we've, uh, you know, if you look at GST, if you look at uh, uh, the insolvency code, if you look at IBC, if you look at RERA, if you look at lowering the corporate tax and a uh, uh, vast range of reforms on each of doing business, uh, India has come a long way. But more than that, I think uh, the kind of infrastructure India has built up uh, in terms of 40 million houses, which is more than the population of Australia, providing about 110 million toilets, uh, which is like providing a toilet to every citizen of Germany or to 223 million pipe connection, which is more than the population of Brazil and 55,000 kilometer of roads. So we've done a lot of infrastructure. But one big thing India has done is uh, the technological transformation uh, we've done in terms of uh, digitizing India right. with every Indian having an identity. We are doing uh, because we created bank accounts, 550 million bank accounts uh, during 2015 to 2017. And we linked it all up with uh, Aadhaar and mobile, we do about 46% of the real fast payments in the world. So, uh, you know, my belief is that uh, uh, a, a good G20 presidency is a function of the political and development narrative. So the challenge is to raise the per capita income yeah. and there's no reason uh, why our per capita income should not grow if we uh, get into high accelerated growth rate. So the challenge for India is really not to grow at about 6.5% uh, but to grow at 8% plus over the next three decades. Right. So if you look at comparative figures for other countries, Japan grew at those rates post-World War II uh, between 19, uh, you know, if you look at uh, the Korea and Taiwan, uh, they've grown at those periods for a very long time between 70 and 90s. Both Korea and Taiwan grew at a scorching pace of about 9% plus for over three decades. And in recent times between 1990 and 2010, China has grown at those periods. My belief is that the compounding power of growth is very enormous and therefore we need to be far more ambitious. We need to be uh, far more reform oriented. We need to constantly grow. And for that to happen, uh, uh, center has done its bit. I think a lot of reforms need now to be carried out at the state level. And states have to become the key driver of growth. And India needs to fire on all cylinders. It's not just uh, services sector. You need to fire on manufacturing. You need to fire on uh, agriculture productivity. But more than that, you need to fire on urbanization. You know, the Prime Minister is really the leader of G20 during India's presidency and uh, Prime Ministers uh, went back to the ancient Indian civilizational saying of uh, uh, Vasudev Kutumbakam, that is, yeah. Yeah. we are one earth, one family, one future, that you may have different, uh, you know, geographical boundaries, you may have different political ideologies, but... Uh, we all come from the same cosmos. Everyone comes from the same cosmic web. And therefore, we should, uh, you know, move away from many of our differences and work for in a human-centric manner and work in a human-centric manner to uh, really lift all humanity. And therefore, uh, he said that our uh, theme should be Vasudev Kutumbakam or One Earth, One Family, One Future. And uh, we should drive that. So in all the ministerial uh, meetings, we have issued outcome documents. Yeah. So there has been an agreement on all developmental issues. Mm -hmm. The difference of opinion has been with reference to only the Bali para. Mm -hmm. That is para 3 and 4. Yeah. Out of which, uh, now there is an agreement on para 4, broadly. Yeah. The para 3 is still left. 
So there's a difference of opinion only on one para. On the Russia. On the Russia Ukraine, one para. We are quite confident of uh, being able to sort it out during our presidency, but irrespective of whether we sort it out or not, it's important to understand that during our presidency, we said that the Ukraine crisis is not important for us. What is important for us is to deliver growth that is strong, sustainable, inclusive growth to the world. What is important for us is to accelerate the implementation of sustainable development goals because only 12% of the SDGs have been fulfilled. The world, instead of progressing, has gone backwards. What is important for us is climate action and climate change because green development is necessary. What is important for us is restructuring and reforming the multilateral development institutions which were built up in the post-World War II period but have outlived their utility. They were not designed for climate change or for sustainable development goals and we need to look into it. What is important for us is technological transformation and digital public infrastructure. And what is important for us is women empowerment and gender equality. So these have been our priority. We brought these issues in the forefront. And these are the issues of all developing and emerging markets. And we've emerged as the voice of the global south. Uh, well, it was very important because uh, we'd taken a call that we'd hold uh, G20 in every state of India. We did G20 in 60, 60 cities of India. So it was very important that once we decided that we'll do it in every state of India, we did it in Kashmir. It was a resounding success. Uh, it, it went off very well. We were able to demonstrate the soft power of Kashmir. We were able to demonstrate that... Uh, the law and order is absolutely fine. We were able to demonstrate uh, its warmth, its, its great hospitality. And I think, uh, in our view, it has left to a, led to a huge revival of tourism in Kashmir. And I think we'll continue to see the growth of tourism in Kashmir in the days to come. No, I don't think anyone ever raised this issue in G20. This issue has been a non-issue as far as G20 is concerned. We focused on developmental issues. We don't allow domestic issues to spill over into international forum. You know, if you look at the last two decades, all innovation, tech innovations have come from big tech. Big tech. They've come from uh, Microsoft. They've come from Google. They've come from Amazon. They've come from Apple and the western part of the world. Uh, the eastern part of the world, China, they've come from Tencent and Alibaba. And that means they took over citizens' data and actually used it uh, for artificial intelligence and for uh, machine learning. Uh, India created an alternative methodology and that was to create open source, open API, interoperable models uh, where the public interest layer was created on top of which we allowed uh, the private sector to innovate. And India is the only country where phone pay competes with Google pay, Paytm competes with uh, WhatsApp in the market space. There are 40 different apps competing. So during India's presidency, uh, we demonstrated the power of digital public infrastructure that India has built up. And what we built up is really enormous in terms of uh, Diksha and Swayam, Digi Locker, yeah. how we were able to do 2.2 billion COVID vaccination, in the rest of the world. And where uh, the citizens' data is controlled by the citizens through a techno-economic uh, methodology, he gives consent for transfer of the data. And uh, this is the unique thing about what we India has done. And I think this is the model for the rest of the world. And uh, the m definition of DPI and the framework for DPI has now been accepted in the G20. Mm -hmm. And I think 
uh, it's in, the world has realized uh, that for the first time a unique tech innovation has come from an emerging market and this will take us really far so since the definition and framework has now been decided we now need to create a center of excellence which will drive it which will because in the world today 4 billion people do not have a digital identity 2 billion people uh, do not have a bank account uh, 133 countries do not have fast payments so if the world has to benefit from what india has done we need to really transfer technology to many of the developing countries and emerging countries of the south and therefore you need to create a center of excellence and drive much of this to many other parts of the world you know it's important to understand that while we are fully committed to climate action uh, we are not responsible for carbonizing the world what we are talking about in the leaders declaration is not merely climate action we are also talking climate finance mm -hmm. we are also talking about circular economy we are talking about critical minerals we are talking about ending plastic pollution and therefore we are talking about green development in its many facets so blue economy is a very serious issue yeah and blue economy cuts across national boundaries yeah. uh we going to be we are going to have huge plastic in the oceans and uh, i think it's important that we all clean up our uh, oceans we clean up our beaches and therefore ending uh, plastic by 2040 is a key goal right uh, in the g20 right uh, we've said that every country must enact a law to that effect and we've said that ocean cleaning will have to be a very important component of a g20 we right. pushed for that as well right no that doesn't worry because right now uh, the us is fully committed to accelerated action on climate change uh europe is fully committed india is fully committed important thing to understand is that different countries are at different levels of growth there are national circumstances also the fact that the developing countries for whom climate action they are most vulnerable to climate action but they have not contributed to carbonizing the world right. the western part of the world when it was industrializing when it was growing has actually occupied all the carbon space right. so in the name of climate justice it was agreed in copenhagen in 2009 that they will contribute 100 billion dollars a year to the developing countries which has not been lived up to but irrespective of the public commitment which must be lived up to the other key challenge to our mind is that uh private sector flows there's no shortage of resources in the world there are 350 trillion dollars available 150 trillion dollars available with pension funds and with institutional investors that money to flow in has to be de-risked and therefore you need blended finance you need first loss guarantees you need new instruments which will enable money to flow in in addition to the 100 billion dollar and a new cap to be fixed up this resources must flow in and for that to happen the multilateral institutions must play a key and critical role which is what we push for in during our presidency no there's been progress there's definitely been progress but the the ambition has to be to reach 1.5 degree centigrade by uh 2050 right and that would mean that the developed countries which are committed to 2050 should right. really advance their goal by a minimum 10 years yeah. they should enhance it to 2040 that is my uh, strong view for the world because they are the ones who have actually occupied all the carbon space so if they advance it that will and they allow more resources to flow because 
the developing countries need both technology they need resources that technology and resources can only come from developed part of the world to the developing countries and for that to happen uh, i think the multilateral financial institutions which are not designed for climate action and sustainable development goals will have to be restructured in a very big way for sdgs and for climate action is that happening that's happening in during our presidency there's a committee headed by nk singh and by uh, larry summers which is recommending its reports we'll look into that report and No, he's talked about bigger and better banks, and you know, we entirely agree that bigger and better and uh, banks are necessary. And uh, but the ability of the bank must be its ability to raise resources from the private sector. It's not just its balance sheet, but the global balance sheet which it should play on, uh, because its own resources are limited. It does only direct lending. It should be able to do far more indirect lending. and get a lot of blended finance to allow resources to flow in and that's important to our mind and that is where uh, the report of larry yeah. summer and nk singh yeah. will help us yeah. to ensure that there's more of indirect lending taking place i think one of the key achievements of india will be uh, it would have played a key role in <coughs> what the prime minister has driven and written about and talk to all the leaders about the african union becoming a permanent member african union becoming a permanent member it will be about uh, making all the the focus of our presidency as you'll see will be on leaving no one behind uh, the focus of our presidency will be speaking in big as uh, for the unheard for the uh, countries which have uh, you know whose voice has never been heard before so we'll speak as a voice of the developing countries throughout our g20 presidency i think not only has he changed the perception of how the world looks at india but he's uh, created a brand equity of india which is very unique of uh, a, a country which is rapidly developing advancing when in 2014 we were at 10th position we've gone to the 5th position he's created an image of a country which is de- technologically very powerful he's created an image of india uh, which is uh, focused on doing infrastructure development because our infrastructure capital outlay from the budgets has gone up by almost uh, 150% in the last 3 years uh, he's created a perspective of india which is focused on massive amount of uh, uh good in terms of uh, benefits to the citizens of india and i think his personal equation with all the top global leaders of the world has been outstanding no we have done very well when we started the launch the startup india movement there were just about 156 startups today we have over a over a lack of startups we have about 110 unicorns because of the global financial architecture right now uh, resources to the extent that they flew into india during 2021 may not be flowing but still we are getting about 25 to 30 billion into a startup per year which is a lot of resources and a lot of money important thing is that indians need to fund indian startups and therefore uh, indian family houses indian businesses all need to really provide resources into the indian startup we need a fund of funds uh, which has done we have a fund of fund for startup which has done very well but we need a fund of funds for deep tech so india must get into deep tech uh, new areas sunrise areas of growth uh, like uh, Uh, advanced chemistry cell battery like electric mobility like mobile manufacturing green hydrogen all these are uh, really the new sunrise areas of growth where uh, young startups will require resources so we need deep tech but i think more important than that is that our insurance companies our uh, pension funds our 
uh, Indians must fund Indian startups. That's important. So I think India has achieved uh, big things as far as digital transformation is concerned because when we started Pran- Pradhan Mantri Jandhan Yojana, we had only 17% bank accounts. Today, all, almost 72% of the women have bank accounts. And uh, also, it's important that, uh, uh, you know, uh, we have a vast, uh, you know, if you, uh, there's one study by World Economic Forum that to bring gender parity, it'll take... Uh, 132 years. Now, we don't have 132 years. Uh, We need to do this in a decade, decade and a half. And that means what the Prime Minister is talking about is that putting women into positions of leadership, women-led development. uh, That's important. Uh, And uh, that is why we brought uh, women development, gender equality at the center stage. It's never happened before in G20 that women and gender play a critical role in this and uh, uh, a very major component of our leaders declaration will be focused on this issue uh, including gender divide including how women will look at uh, your uh, climate change issues yeah. uh, labor force participation many of these issues are very critical issues in G20 We've been the voice of the global south uh, during our presidency. Uh, we've uh, created a huge sense of confidence amongst the developing world. Uh, a similar focus needs to be sustained during Brazil's presidency, during South Africa's presidency. And uh, we'll constantly remain at the forefront of this, constantly bringing issues of the developing countries. No, no. What setback? Other than uh, we'll have a joint communique on everything. If there's a challenge on the Ukraine para, it will not be our making. It's a making of uh, we have not. We did not do do World War One. We did not do World War Two. If there's a war going on somewhere, why why are we responsible? Hold the countries which are responsible for the war. They are responsible, not us. We have no issue. We'll drive, we'll continue to drive the growth, the development and the financial inclusion agenda.